Good afternoon, everyone. You're very welcome to our first uh, webinar of the year of 2022. Um, the title of the webinar is uh, Nutrition and Nurturing Mental Health. Uh, and we're delighted to, to welcome along today uh, Sarah Kyo, a uh, dietitian and nutritionist, uh, to give a presentation and talk about some top ideas and uh, very insightful points uh, of view from her perspective uh, around uh, nutrition and the link between good nutrition and, and uh, mental health and how that can nurture our mental health. So I'm just going to wait a, a couple of seconds or a little bit of time to welcome a few more people on before we, we, we progress with, with the webinar, because um, just to give a little a minute or so to, to um, allow people to settle and to welcome people forward. Okay, now no doubt people will be joining as, as I'm speaking and, uh, you know, uh, to anyone who's, who comes as there, you're, you're all very welcome, uh, as I say, to, to our first webinar of the year. Um, just to give you a brief overview of, uh, of AWARE and what we do, yeah, my name is Stephen McBride and I'm the Director of Services at AWARE. And, and what we do at AWARE is we provide support, education and information to people who experience depression, bipolar disorder, and other related mood conditions, including anxiety. So we have a suite of uh, support services from our support groups, support line, our support mail, and an online life skills program, as well as a virtual program uh, delivering life skills uh, to people. And we also have psychoeducational programs and a, a wide repository of information on our website. So I'd encourage you all to, uh, in, to look and, and to view our website, aware.ie, for further information on our uh, services and psychoeducational programs. Just before I begin uh, to uh, and, and to pass you over to Sarah, is, is that we have a, a Q and A box that you're all very much invited to um, submit your questions uh, that you may have in response to uh, what Sarah is going to speak about. Uh, and unfortunately, we won't be able to have time to attend to every question that is is fielded. Uh, by yourselves and if there is something ar around a concern that you may have uh, we'd also encourage you to take that to, to specifically your GP you know if you have a concern uh, or if you're triggered or if something comes up in relation to the material that's presented today uh, we would always encourage people to attend attend their GP to have a consultation. So without further ado I'm going to uh, pass you over to, to Sarah Kyo to uh, introduce herself and to welcome you along and thank you so very much for participating in, in this webinar, our first webinar of 2022. Over to you, Sarah. Great, Stephen. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I, I'm Sarah Kyo. I'm a dietitian, registered dietitian, and I've been working in nutrition um, at this stage about 25 years um, in, in a variety of different areas. But I think it doesn't matter where you work. Mental health is going to turn up all the time as, as issues in, in different ways. So um, I've been running my own business, my own clinics um, for the last 25 years. And I am on Instagram as well. So I have a lot of tips there on my Instagram page at Sarah Kyo or D. And my website is eatwell.ie. But I think just my own experience working through and I've worked in hospitals and clinics over the years is the impact that what we eat and how we eat can actually have on our mood is huge. And I know we were talking about setting this up and having lots of different slides and things, but I think we really wanted to give people an opportunity to ask questions. But what I did want to touch on was a couple of the really key nutrients that I've seen over the years being an issue in terms of mental health. And I always think that January is a bit of a funny time for food anyway because i think this is a moment where you know we're all encouraged to eat or eat to you know absolute explosion over christmas and then suddenly in january you're wrong for eating over christmas and now you have to get skinny and detox and lose weight and you know and i think if you're vulnerable or you're a bit sensitive about weight and things like that it's this huge pressure and then people are like well i've got to cut this out or they feel bad if they're eating things and it's i think mentally it can be a huge issue especially if people are struggling with things like eating disorders or there's an anxiety about you know am i eating the right food am i you know so i kind of say look there's, there's no perfect way of eating. And I think that's where we'll start with it. And then particularly if we're looking at things around mental health, some of the key nutrients, and there's a good few to take a look at. And I often find people are aware of things like B vitamins and how important they are for mental health. But the one that I've seen consistently make the biggest difference is actually iron. And iron is, 
it, it's such a funny nutrient. We're all aware of it. It's probably one of the nutrients we know the most about. If I start talking about copper to people, they don't really think about that as a nutrient that we need, even though we do. But we know about iron. And we one of the things about iron, that, and I think when I people, we kind of know that being low in iron really affects your mood, but we don't always connect it with being depressed or being anxious or you know just not really functioning very well. But we do know that in Ireland, almost 50% of women in Ireland don't eat enough iron. And straight away, that tells us a lot about maybe some of our energy levels being low. And that's the first thing that iron does, because iron's job is to carry oxygen around the body. And every cell in your body needs iron and needs oxygen to make energy. So if we have less iron, we have less oxygen getting to the cells, we have lower energy levels, but that affects everything. So you're more tired, but also your brain isn't functioning like it should. You're not thinking as quickly, your concentration is gone. We often talk about having just this lack of motivation. So it becomes harder even to start to look after yourself. But we do see um, when iron gets low is that your appetite can go as well. And you know, that whole cycle then comes in where you're eating a little bit less, so your overall nutrition goes down um, and that's gonna roll into so many other factors with it. So I would always take a good look at iron. As I said, 50% of women don't eat enough iron. Men tend to be okay. Um, men tend to eat bigger portions of food. And they also, particularly because they don't have periods, they don't tend to lose as much iron um, with that. So men tend to be okay for it, but women and teenage girls can really, really miss out. So it's one that we do keep an eye on. So <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things to take a look at is where do we get iron and you know the famous one is always going to be the red meat and um excuse me one second i'm just going to clear my throat sorry so red meat is a fantastic source of iron um but i think there's a lot of fear around red meat in the last while and i'm seeing a lot of people who've started to cut meat out of their diet they're not necessarily catching back up on iron in other places so red meat actually is really good we as i said we hear a lot of bad stuff about red meat but from a health point of view red meat's absolutely fine where we hear an awful lot is say red meat and cancer, but it's really processed red meat that is the issue. So it's things like your heavily processed, your bacon, your ham, those kind of foods are the ones that we see slightly increase risk of colon cancer if you're eating a lot of them. But when you go for sort of unprocessed sort of, you know, if you're buying your mince meat or your, your steak pieces or things like that, that meat is fine. And even the World Cancer Research Fund will tell you that you can safely have up to 500 grams of red meat a week before we see any increase um, or relationship with colon cancer. You know, and we would often talk about having red meat three times a week for iron because it's a, not just a source of iron, but it's also easy for the body to absorb the iron from red meat. Now, you don't have to eat red meat. There's lots of other places to get it, but don't be afraid of it if it's a food that you actually like to eat. So you will also get iron in things like chicken and turkey. But the problem here is that the iron is all in the legs. There's actually very little iron in things like chicken breast and um, turkey breast. So they're great for other things. They have B vitamins and they have protein, but they don't have um, the iron really in them. So if you're really living on chicken breast, and this is what a lot of women do, it's a lot of chicken breast. So there's not a whole lot of iron coming in there. So you need to make sure when you're having the chicken, there's something else on the plate that has the iron in there. Um, we'll also look at things like eggs would be a good source of iron. Shellfish, especially mussels are good. On the vegetable side though, you can get lots of iron in foods like spinach and kale are good sources of iron. The myth I hear all the time is people saying any green veg is good for iron and that's not true at all. Um, you know, if you have a serving of broccoli, you'd need to have about 25 servings of broccoli a day to actually get your iron. Um, so broccoli is brilliant again for other things, but it, the, for the green veg, it's kale and spinach. But you will get lots of iron in lentils, you'll get it in beans, you know, things like chickpeas, you'll get it in seeds and nuts, so things like, um, you know, almonds and hazelnuts. So lots of different places to pick it up. But the key thing is you need to be getting at least two foods a day um, that have iron in them. Surprisingly, um, fortified foods are fantastic. And so fortified breakfast cereals. Um, are actually the major source of iron in children's diets in Ireland. And would you believe bread is the major source of iron in the adult, for adults in Ireland, um, that there is actually iron in whole grains in particular. Um, but just really think about getting um, those foods in. So they'd be a really important one that I would, I would start off and take a look at. And I don't know if anybody has any questions on the iron so far. Yeah, they're, they're, they're after coming in, uh, oh, Sarah, <laughs> all right. And I think you've answered it. Uh, you, you maybe have anticipated what I might have said, you know, in relation to a, a broad spectrum. You know, there's a few people in the audience who are uh, either vegetarian or vegan or both. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were wondering about how to uh, access that source, source of iron if they're, if they're non-meat eating. And actually brilliantly, because what we do know is a lot of people who are on a vegan or vegetarian diet, today know about getting their protein from their beans and lentils and nuts so we're actually finding in studies now that vegans typically have slightly higher iron 
than meat eaters Very because if the meat eaters are all eating just chicken breast or they're having you know fish wouldn't have a massive amount of iron in it either they're actually you'd be surprised you'll actually get more iron in your lentil curry um with that so um you know i 20 years ago it was different when people were vegetarian the same knowledge wasn't out there um with it but today i don't see it as a huge issue with vegan and vegetarian for for um iron it's still it's still something we keep an eye on um but it's you know i wouldn't be too worried about that like i said red meat is great but it's far from the only place where you're going to pick up iron mm. Mm. just another quick question in relation to that i suppose around the idea of these key nutrients and mm-hmm. that's one thing that sparked my interest listening to you sarah can, can that have an impact on, on, on as you say mood you know i know you're talking about iron and mood but the key nutrients because someone has quest- asked a question regarding um you know weight gain around uh perimenopausal in increase of, of weight gain and what link there might be between thinking about one's diet and uh, these key nutrients so i think i mean if you're talking about weight gain that's sort of that perimenopausal weight gain that nearly sort of middle age spread a little bit generally what happens around there um less to do with nutrition and more to do with losing muscle actually as we get older so we're going to wander away from the mental health side for a second but okay. we lose muscle naturally as we age and actually we start losing muscle at the age of 25 we lose about two percent a year muscle is really what decides how fast or how slow your metabolism is Mm. so if Mm. you think of losing a little bit of muscle every year by the time you're into your 40s your 50s you have a lot less muscle and so your metabolism is slower so even if you're eating the same food you can suddenly see a little bit more weight coming on so actually the solution there Mm. is just rebuilding some of that muscle you know swimming yoga pilates yes. you know if you like going to the gym things like that that you just and but muscle everywhere we're good on the legs we'll do the walking but a little bit of upper body work um from that sort of middle age perimenopausal um spread is actually going to be useful great that's very helpful yeah thanks sarah no worries um the next nutrient i would definitely take a look at then is vitamin d and vitamin D, I mean, I think we've heard a lot about it in the, in the last few years in terms of immunity. And vitamin D has always been famous about being good for bones. But we know that vitamin D also plays a role in anxiety and depression as well. Um, <clears throat> so from a mood point of view, your vitamin D is going to be essential. Now, the big problem for vitamin D in Ireland is that we are supposed to get vitamin D from the sun. And famous for our sun, we are not in this country. So we tend to miss out. And we sort of two issues with the sun. Um, the first is that from October through to March, the sun that hits Ireland is too weak for us to make any vitamin D. So I'm looking at my window here, it's a sunny day, but it's January. So if I go for a walk today, I'm still not making any vitamin D because the sun is just mm-hmm. not strong enough. During the summer then, so sort of March to September, um, the sun is stronger, but we still get cloud cover. Um, I always love the experts call it cloud cover. I think everyone in Ireland calls it rain. Um, mm. So we get the rain through the summer. We're wearing our sunscreen, which we should. But there's all of those things. So we do know that there, we can get quite low in vitamin D in Ireland. So um, there's definitely specific recommendations for children and, and older or people over 65 to take vitamin D definitely in the winter. It's something I would encourage most people to do. Um, you don't need huge doses of it. You're looking at maybe five to 10 micrograms of vitamin D a day, which is not a massive dose, but it's just a top up. And you will get vitamin D in foods like oily fish and eggs, but it's difficult to eat enough of them to get all of your vitamin D. So from food alone, um, I wouldn't look at it, but the vitamin D is an important one that we do look at um, from the point of view of um, mood as well. I'm getting over the, the winter cold. Mm. Um, so one of the other nutrients to take a look at then is the omega-3s. And these are just going to be incredibly important um, from a mood point of view. And there's a huge amount of research looking at particularly fish-based omega-3s and mood and brain function. And it sort of comes back to the fact, I don't know if most people know, but your brain is mostly made out of fat. So about 60% of your brain is actually fat. But most of that fat is a very particular type of omega-3 called DHA. And I suppose the crucial time for our brains, to be honest, is while our mothers are pregnant with us, because we are going to make 75% of our brain cells before we're even born. And the other 25% are in place, you know, usually around the age of one to two. Um, But after that, it's up to us to keep topping up omega-3s in our diet so that we actually keep our brains nice and healthy. And it's like anything, we update and remodel all the time in terms of how we look after our bodies and our brain is no different. And we know from research that people who are eating a lot of fish or who are taking fish oils, you know, <clears throat> even from an Alzheimer's and dementia point of view, they seem to get a little bit less. But we also know that they're involved in reducing things like anxiety in particular, there's big links. And there's some studies suggesting that omega-3s can be helpful for depression. Now, they're never going to replace um, if you're on medicine for that, but they certainly will support and particularly around things like anxiety that can be very, very helpful. So you're looking at eating fish. 
um, if you can. But the oily fish is what you're after. Your white fish don't have a huge amount of omega-3. Now, they will have a bit. Um, and sea bass is a white fish that actually has a decent amount of omega-3 in it. So if you like that one, that's a good one to go for. But things like salmon, mackerel, herring, trout, all of those kind of oily fish are fantastic for the omega-3s that are really going to be nourishing the brain. And the nice thing is it doesn't matter what you do to them. OK, so fresh or frozen or fried or covered in batter and deep fried, you know, you'll still get the omega-3s. And um, I don't mention tuna here because although tuna um, is, it's a really good fish, it's good for vitamin D and protein, it doesn't have a huge amount of omega-3 and tin tuna, most tin tuna doesn't have any omega-3. But if you go for things like tin salmon or tin mackerel, they do. And they're kind of, they're a good economical and very convenient way to actually get some fish in as well. Um, so I would definitely be encouraging people to look at fish, you know, twice a week. Um, I mean, we know there's lots of benefits throughout the body for it, but from a brain point of view, they're really good. But if you absolutely hate fish um, and you're never going to eat fish, a fish oil supplement can be useful. But I would encourage if you can eat the fish, do because there's so many other nutrients in the fish. You have a lot of B vitamins, you have selenium, you have iodine. They're a great food to take if you can at all. Um, and that's going to be a really, really good one to go for. Mm. Great. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions on fish or fish oils or anything there. We a quick look um that hasn't come up uh re oh yeah re um magnesium and zinc um regarding omega-3 i found out that i was eating farm salmon daily not wild and perhaps the omega-3 is lower non-existent is this true no and it's it's a question that comes up a lot because i think you know the farm salmon is just everywhere at the moment and it's actually it has been fantastic because it has gotten this oily fish actually out to more people than they would have eaten it years ago but at the same time you know yourself you something comes out that's kind of good and then you go online and there's all this stuff about how bad it is for you but actually we know from the studies on irish farm salmon that it actually has slightly more omega-3 than the wild salmon would you believe mm -hmm. um and it's because it's mainly fed on mackerel which itself is a big source of omega-3 <clears throat> with that. So um, no, there's absolutely no problem with omega-3s in farmed salmon and the farmed salmon definitely has really, really good levels of omega-3 and it's accessible, it's a lot cheaper, you know, it's easier to get. So no, absolutely no problem um, mm. doing that as mm. well. But you're right in terms of mentioning um, supplements like magnesium and selenium. Like the thing about the human body is it, it needs everything to be well. You know, there's no point saying, well, mm. just have magnesium and then don't eat your iron. You know, we need to have a little bit of everything, but we do know that magnesium Magnesium is a particularly important nutrient when it comes to stress. And magnesium is interesting because, you know, if we look at something like iron, you know, we need 14 milligrams of iron a day. It's pretty steady. But with something like magnesium, the amount of magnesium you need can vary a little bit depending on um, the size of your body. It can depend on if you're going through a lot of stress. Sometimes we need more magnesium. If you're going through surgery, you might need a little bit more. So magnesium is one that can be an issue. And one of the things I see a lot is it's quite difficult to get the amounts of magnesium you need if you never eat nuts and seeds. So your nuts and your seeds are your big, big place to get magnesium. And it's, you know, they've definitely gotten a lot more popular in the last few years. Um, but I still think people could do with a lot more, you know, the idea of the spoonful of seeds into your breakfast cereal in the morning, a handful of nuts somewhere through mm. the day. If you like nut butters, they can be brilliant. Um, fish is going to give you a little bit of magnesium. And fish is a good source of selenium as well, but you're still looking for selenium in um, your nuts and seeds. And there, the magnesium um, is going to be particularly important around sleep. And I think one thing we see a lot is that, you know, it tends to come on two sides. If you're anxious, you tend not to sleep so well, but if you don't sleep well, that on its own can drive anxiety. Mm. So it can be a bit of a chicken and egg. So magnesium is always going to be important for helping sleep. And we've lots of studies that are showing us that people who are getting adequate amounts of magnesium do, they tend to sleep a little bit longer, but they also tend to have a, a less broken sleep. So magnesium, but now again, before we rush out and buy supplements, which is always, I know when I talk about individual nutrients, people tend to think, right, I'll go and buy this tablet. Now that can be helpful if you're trying to get your diet up and running, you know, if you're trying to tidy up what you're doing, but if you can think of rather than necessarily going for supplements that you're saying, well, can I get the sunflower mm. seeds in? Can I have the handful of almonds, you know, just to bring that in through the day is going to work really, really well. Mm -hmm. with that and that's something to think about in terms of iron as well because actually it's not a good idea to take an iron supplement unless you've had a blood test to show that you're low in iron so rather than just going out and taking an iron supplement um it's useful just if you think you might be low in iron to actually chat again go into your gp and just get a check done but you can look at your food and bring in iron foods very safely and there's no problem to do that yeah yeah um, 
I just see there's a question popped up here that if you don't eat fish, should you supplement with an omega-3? I, I would definitely try and eat the fish. And uh, But if you're going to go for a supplement for omega-3, where we're seeing the benefits in terms of anxiety are with fish omega-3s. We're not seeing the same benefit from plant-based omega-3s, unfortunately. Um, so if you could take a supplement, they can be helpful. But the thing about fish, if you hate fish, um, which I find a lot of people like taste of it, 16 goes will get you eating anything. Um, cause I know sometimes 16. 16 and it's, you know, for all the years that and people come into the clinic and I'm going, right, I need you to eat fruit and veg. Like I hate them. And you're like, well, how do you overcome that? And it's, it's a funny thing that if you're not familiar with, um, a food, if your body is not familiar with the food, mm. the taste of it and the feel of it, eating a new food can actually be very difficult. And I, you know, I think most of us have a food that we absolutely hate and we nearly gag if we think we're going to eat it. Aub aubergines. That's for you. Okay. So that's, well, here's your challenge now, Stephen. Um, <laughs> we're going to get you eating aubergine, but actually, and I find bananas, lamb, mushrooms, you know, people all have, most of us have a food that if we eat, even the thoughts of it nearly makes us want sure. to be sick. But what's happening there is your body's not familiar with it. So mm. it kind of thing, if you think about it, it's nearly like your body says, well, this is poisonous. So just get it out. Just out mm. whereas if you actually eat a little bit now i mean a really tiny bit but you do that over a few weeks over a few months as you're eating it initially it'll be really difficult because your body is sort of panicking slightly mm. but as you keep eating it your body goes well you know he's eating this aubergine he's not dead mm. obviously the aubergine is actually safe and you can start to to take it and you'll find the first four or five times are the worst but after kind of about five times your body's kind of like okay it's it's not too bad and the funny thing is is after about 16 goes you'll start to like the food it's very interesting it's, it's a really yeah. interesting one um it's it's a technique actually we often use with fussy eating children but it works for adults as well so you know if there's a food you really hate but you know would be good for you now i'm not talking something you're allergic to or that makes you sick that's, that's sure, completely different course, yeah but if it's a, a, a sensation thing or a taste thing actually you can sort of train yourself into eating um, an awful lot of foods with that that's very progressive and positive i think sarah because it shows this idea that something little and often can lead to momentum being built yeah. And I think that uh, applies because it's a behavioral change, isn't yes. it? You know, that yeah. you're affecting some change on your behavior. The same applies to, to exercise. I know you were speaking yeah. back to that around vitamin D, you know, and obviously the different uh, seasons that we experience. Mm -hmm. But the idea of uh, keeping our, our uh, especially at the age of 40s and 50s, in our 40s and 50s, keeping yeah. our bodies as, as strong as possible, you know, and the link, the real link between exercise, diet, mental health yeah. and as you're speaking to which is very helpful uh, anxiety and depression um, and, and and how food can have play quite a, a significant and core role in that and i think i mean sometimes as you're saying it's, it's looking at the little and often because sometimes you know you sit down and you say okay you need to do all these things with your diet and then you need to do some exercise and then you need to and it just looks like this huge and i think if you're in a, in a place where really your mental health isn't great and you think well mm. i have to do all of this whereas if you actually come back and you just go one thing and what i think is quite funny particularly with the vegetables is the first two or three vegetables that you try and you do this with you actually find after you've done a few your body is nearly open to new foods and it becomes easier to bring in new foods mm. but it's a small thing and i would always say even with any changes that you're making to what you're eating is you give yourself a year to make a change you don't try and do it all in one week or because i think the the january where everyone goes on yes. this diet and everyone gives up after a week because if you try and change your entire way of eating overnight, it's it's incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you do one small thing and just build mm -hmm. it, by the end of the year, you have a whole lot of kind of small things that you can actually build up with that. Mm -hmm. Because there was a question in there. I was just thinking, uh, listening to you, Sarah, is that we all have to and we all do have a, a relationship with food. Mm -hmm. It's one of the core relationships we have and what sense we make of it and what it means to us. And you're speaking about it from nutrition point of view. And obviously mm -hmm. there's pleasure and food is a, yes. a core relationship of it too. I suppose there was a question there uh, regarding how does someone, how might someone feed well? It feels as though, pardon the pun using a, a food terminology, a chicken and egg aspect to it. Mm -hmm. You know, when someone uh, is describing in a question about uh, experiencing self-loathing and feeling very depressed. And wh what kind of sense do you make of that around how they might you know, obviously notwithstanding everyone's own individual relationship with food, but to mm -hmm. try and connect to that area or how do we feed well, you know? I think it can be really hard. And I think, as you said, we do have our relationship with food. And I think few of us grow up with a very positive relationship with food. I think even in, in the loveliest of homes, most of us have had a parent who was on a diet and there was good mm. foods and there was bad foods. And we mm. certainly have a huge amount of judgment in and around food where people nearly yes. are fearful about eating. Or what I've seen is people are punishing themselves 
in yes. some way by eating foods they know are harmful that I've done something bad today or I you know I don't and I'm, I'm going to punish myself by eating or I suppose what I've seen over the years is someone who maybe was trying to lose weight and they ate a packet of crisps and rather than going had the crisps they're just crisps they've said you know this is terrible I'm a bad person I've done this awful thing now I'm going to eat the yes. whole six pack of crisps I'm nearly you know and I think it can be hard to break that cycle with that and I think you know a lot of the work that I would do when I've worked with people over the years is trying to take that judgment out of food and I think when you sit down with dietitians um we're the least judgy people about food you could imagine you know Great. people think you know when I meet people the first time they nearly cover what they're eating because they think I'm going to analyze it I don't care um mm. you know and if you if you actually go to conferences and big meetings with dietitians there's always chocolate for dessert always you know it's always there because as you said food isn't just nutrition that's its fundamental role. But as you said, mm. we've this whole relationship with it. It's the eating, it's the pleasure, it's the socializing of it. It's being yes. able to sit with other people and have that lovely interaction, you know, all around food. And there's there's so many different sort of relationships with food. It, it's not an easy one, you know, and I mm. think it's it's a little bit of, you know, caring about yourself enough to, mm. to step into that. And that's often the difficulty because if you feel you're not worth it, it's difficult then to make an effort to change food. But I would always say, again, when people talk about changing food or diet for any reason, they tend to do too much in one go. Yes. And that's what I'd always come back to. It is a huge job to change your whole eating habits overnight. It's huge. Mm. But you can start with one small thing. You can put one spoonful of sunflower seeds and eat that every day. Mm. And that's one really small. And, it, you know, sometimes people go, that's so tiny. How can it make a difference? It does. It will start. It will bring in some fiber. It will bring in selenium. It will bring in a little bit of protein those small little changes and you don't have to make it's not a huge effort to start that necessarily um and you can build and you just make it normal you do it for three weeks and it's normal and then you bring the next thing and that's normal and look at it as a year rather than looking at it as something overnight yeah, build, building blocks you know back to the little and often yeah, small and often. steps small yeah. significant steps you know yeah. and and not getting into kind of maybe the the self-defeating thinking or punitive behavior, like eating the six pack of crisps when you've had yes. one, which, yeah. uh, you, you know, uh, so trying to be measured if, if mm. you can, rather than um, the problem becoming more exacerbated. Okay. And, and I think, as you said, it's, it's, you know, if you have done something that you consider wrong, and this is the thing that I, I really dislike about a lot of what we see online about nutrition is that there is good foods and there is bad foods. And I think, you know, up to recently it was all around sort of weight or calories or fat but now we have environment and sustainability and i've seen people getting feeling really guilty because they've eaten some red meat because they read somewhere that it's damaging the environment or they can't eat this food and there's just now this whole other layer and i'm not saying these are not all important things they are but i think we need to balance how we look at all of that and we need i would always say we need to take the guilt out of eating i think if if mm. i would love just to see that go it's just food and you have to nourish your body and i think it can be very difficult to balance all of that but if you find you're someone who's punishing yourself with food it's just to think about that and realize that you don't need to be perfect in terms of your food to get really lovely benefits from nutrition and you know i spend so much time really saying this get it right 60 70 percent of the time you're doing brilliantly if you happen, I don't know anyone who has a 100% perfect diet. And actually, I'm always deeply suspicious sure. of someone who has this perfect thing going on. Because I think, oh, why are you so rigid? You know, yes. what's going on on that side with it? So I think, you know, you're looking at getting good nutrition in, but it is perfectly okay to have the bar of chocolate, the packet of crisps. You know, those things are okay. And they're a pleasure. And I often talk about food that's good for the body and food that's good for the soul. And we need both. You mm. know, we need to actually mm. have that pleasure in food as well. Yeah. There was a point made in one of the, the questions around eating mindlessly, and I suppose yes. one of the opposite of that, and, and it's very uh, prevalent in the work in the sphere of mental health, is around being mindful and mm -hmm. being conscious of the present moment and what's going on for us right here, right now. So how would you see uh, a relationship in that regard around trying to eat mindfully? And you, you know, and I suppose that, that could be both practical, but also kind of cognitive. It could be put into the behavior and also how we think. Well, I think if, if we're thinking about it from a mindful point of view, and it's not an area I have a huge expertise in um, with sure. that, but I suppose what I would really think about is that we're eating food that we like, that we take time to actually sort of create food or eat food that we like, because I think 
again, when we talk about healthy eating, people have this idea of, you know, dry bread and boring salads and things like that. And yet we can eat very healthy food that's lovely. And we forget that your Irish stew is a really healthy meal that's also comforting and tasty. You know, your spaghetti bolognese is another really healthy meal. We don't, you know, necessarily have to have very complicated foods, but we do need to eat things that feel good to us and that taste nice. And I think if we were going to think about our food at all, that's where I would be thinking. Um, you know, not everyone is into cooking, but we can look at different ways of adding different foods in. Um, I mean, there's a million and two recipes online that we can try from very simple to more complex as you go. And that can be a nice thing to do. And it, it is something I would encourage people to take a look at is to just get into a little bit of simple cooking because it allows you to think about what you're eating a little bit um, and you have a little bit more control over what's actually going into your food. You can balance your nutrition a little bit better. Mm. But I think you get into... I know for me, I, I do like cooking, but for me, there's a, a relaxation in going through the methodology of cooking. Um, mm. You know, don't, don't get me wrong, there's days when I'm cooking for my family and I wish anyone else would come in and cook the yeah. dinner in the evening. But for me, I do get mindfulness might not be the right word for it but it's just that's it, part of I would put that nearly in and view it as a relaxation part of the day yes if that makes yes. any sense and it does yeah. it does indeed and I suppose the practicality aspect of it I was wondering about too is and and it, it may have kind of a, a a link to the opposite of of eating mindlessly or eating too too much you know the idea of not thinking about it is planning or structuring insofar as is possible that actually having a routine or some time-based aspects around uh, food, which is individual uh, to people, of course, you know, uh, around their rhythms. But generally speaking, you know, the practicality of not eating too late at night or mm -hmm. that you cook your favorite uh, uh, meal of the week on a certain day or, or whatever, you know. I mean, I think the, the mindless eating, I like this, the, I suppose what I, what I would say, and I'm sure a lot of people here will, will be very familiar with, is that sometimes you're just eating and it has nothing to do with hunger. And, yes. But it has everything to do with stress or it has everything to do with how you're feeling at the time. And the reality is that eating makes us feel good. You know what I mean? It makes us feel better. Um, it might be temporary, but it works. So sometimes when we are feeling very anxious or feeling very low, eating is nearly a self-medication. Um, the problem there is that mm. if you're eating a lot of foods that maybe wouldn't be nutritionally balanced or, you know, you can end up with kind of issues around weight or maybe cholesterol and that in itself can be another stress. But I think we need to be very kind to ourselves about it because the body actually mm. drives that a little bit and we don't necessarily have control over that if you've mm. had a really stressful day you know i often talk about you know eat carbohydrate and mood because nobody comes home from a stressful day and goes you know i really need a salad everyone comes mm. home from a stressful day and they want carbohydrates they want sugary foods mm. they want chocolate they want crisps they want a big bowl of pasta and it's because carbohydrate actually does help us to relax so yes. You know, I, I would say be very kind to yourself if eating is what you do when you're feeling bad, because there's lots of people can drink alcohol to excess. People can look at drugs. You know, there's lots of things we mm -hmm. do to feel better. But if eating is, is a huge part of how you're taking care of yourself to the point where maybe it's not helping from a health point of view, it's looking for other things. And, you know, often we're looking at what's the stress can we do anything so that's why we talk about exercise because if you're someone who would maybe mindlessly eat when you are stressed a little bit of exercise can help to tip that back you know if you have a bath that can you know if you have a bath in the house yeah. 20 minutes in the bath can tip that back there's things we yes. can do just to look at it so it's not to be unkind to yourself because you do that but it's to recognize okay this is how i'm handling what's going on at the moment is there another way maybe i can handle it or something different i can do but coming back to what you're saying about planning, planning is very helpful as well, because, you know, as I said, like, like a lot of working parents and you're coming home and you're cooking and all of that kind of thing. It's the coming in and the stress of what is for dinner, what have I got in the house, what will everybody eat? And I have to say, I sat down there a few years ago and worked out a four week menu cycle for our house. I, and, see. Um, I just did Monday to Friday because I figure on weekends, look, can do it like but what it was for us. And I, it was so 1950s, but it has taken so much stress for me mm. because I go well Monday week one we have this on Monday and this is on Tuesday and this on Wednesday so at the weekend I know what's going to be planned for the week I can go shopping I go to the mm. supermarket I buy those foods so then on Tuesday when I go what's for dinner I go well this is for dinner I already have the vegetables I need or the potatoes I need or the meat that I need and I don't have to start it's it's one thing I don't have to think about so it's nearly one less mental job to do mm. and I have to say that took a huge amount of stress out of my life um mm. with that and you know it doesn't have to be a four-week menu cycle it'll be one week or two weeks mm. and it you know the nice thing about taking the time to sit down and do that is you can plan in have mm. i got the fish in have mm. i got the fruit and veg in have i got some nuts mm. in here and for me i just do it for dinners 
um, because that works for me. And I've worked with people where we just do it for breakfast until they kind of get breakfast sorted out and they do that. Mm. And that might take three months and that's okay. Yes. And then when breakfast is, is working, then we can go and do a menu for lunch and, and so on. So it's just, it's nice. As you said, the planning is great because then you're not there on the day where there's nothing in the house and you're going for the takeaway or you're going for the bowl of cereal mm. or you're just skipping the meal altogether or you're mindlessly eating on kind of less healthy mm. foods. So a little bit of planning, yes, can make a really big difference if yeah. you're in the place to do it. And that's paying conscious attention to it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Planning is the paying of conscious attention in a broader picture, as you said, yes. around the four week plan, yeah. but also on a daily basis, because that provides some kind of routine and stability almost. It, it provides some kind of uh, containing, really, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think well, as well, when, you plan, when you plan a little bit, even if the rest of the day has gone pear shaped, <laughs> at least, you mm -hmm. know, dinner is going to be all right. You know, yes. something like that. And I think it just gives a little bit of an anchor back when you are starting out to try and change anything with nutrition. Mm -hmm. OK, there's a little bit of uh, commentary in, in the in the uh, feedback box, the Q&A box around uh, binge eating or and the, and the kind of corollary of that or the opposite of that maybe as intermittent fasting, which may have. Of LinkedIn, yeah. And yeah. So, so just to gauge your sense of that, Sarah. I think, I mean, intermittent fasting has come along as an idea in the last sort of five or six years. Um, I mean, there's always humans have always been interested in fasting, but usually from sort of a spiritual um, point of view, the idea yeah. of fasting specifically for health, to, to the extent that we see it now, is quite big. So what's the research so when we look at intermittent fasting so there's a couple of different ways that people do this so the two most popular ones are what we call the five two which is where people might fast for two days in the week and then eat um, on the other five days or the other one is what's often called the 16 8 which is where you would eat for a, a defined eight hour period in the day but for the other 16 hours you fast um so are there any benefits so we do see benefits in terms of weight loss with fasting as you can imagine if you're eating less going to lose weight. Is it any better than just reducing calories? The answer to that is no. What we do know is that when you engage in intermittent fasting, so whether it's 5-2 or the 16-8, you typically reduce calories by 25 to 30 percent. Mm -hmm. So you will lose weight with that. But uh, there's been a couple of really good studies on this and one compared people doing the 5-2 and the 16-8 and then to people who just reduce their calories by 30 percent but continue to eat over the normal sort of 10 hours, 12 hours in the day. And what they found was weight loss was identical between all three. Mm. So mm. There, um, the other thing I see with intermittent fasting is there's lots of claims I see online and they talk about that intermittent fasting reduces inflammation or it lowers cholesterol more than anything else. It, it, we're not seeing any difference in, their, in the studies on that. Mm. So really what we see is that intermittent fasting is another tool if someone needs to lose weight for health that it might be one way to do it because it's, you know, if someone is struggling with weight to the point where it's affecting their health, um, it's quite difficult to lose weight and it's very difficult to keep it off. So for some people, it suits them to fast, <clears throat> particularly the 16, excuse me, <clears throat> particularly the 16, eight suits mm. people more than anything else. The five, mm. two people find very difficult. The 16, eight suits quite a few people. Um, but it's really about what works for you. There's no special benefit to fasting over not fasting. And that's, I suppose, the message I'd like to say here. Some people right. like it, some yeah. people don't, but there's no particular reason to do it. I would also, as I said, I would look at carbohydrate and mood quite a bit. I'd be very disinclined to cut out carbohydrates or to really limit it. And I think that we do well mentally when we just have regular food coming in. Um, and, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner is a nice pattern for the day there's a reason mm. humans do that and they do that all over the world it's not just one culture mm. where we do that we have sort of fall into maybe three meals a day pretty much mm. everywhere so it seems to be sort of a, a natural level for us now pe some people are different some people like have a few more snacks and things like that but i have to say I, I like the regularity of it and the other thing is that if you do start cutting out meals or skipping meals you want to be eating really well on your other meals to make up your nutrition. And I mean, really well. Mm -hmm. You know, if we think about it, that, you know, 50 percent of women don't eat enough iron. We know that people, adults in mm -hmm. Ireland, maybe don't hit targets for vitamin A, calcium, 37 percent of you know, people don't necessarily hit their targets for calcium. If you take a whole meal out of the equation, what are you missing? Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you're getting your regular meals in, you have a better chance of getting all of your nutrition. Sure, um, so sure. I tend to like that as an approach. Yeah. So really going back to the very start of your presentation, Sarah, is that by concentrating, you know, and you mentioned vitamin B, vitamin D, and then the omegas. Yeah. So actually thinking about that vis-a-vis -vis whether you're a vegan, vegetarian or a meat eater, mm. that you can attend to those needs and that will have a, a, a positive impact on, on your mental health. Yeah. You know, going back to the very title of this webinar, that will nurture your mental health 
by paying to 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 repeat myself by paying conscious attention to to what we uh, intake into our bodies. I mean, I think, and it's it is just getting the looking at the key nutrients and so things like about the vitamin D and the iron, the omega threes are really good ones to look at. But I also think just kind of regular eating and you were saying even about binging and I think sometimes what I see a lot with people is if they do if they do binge if there's an eating disorder particularly and there's a binge people then starve themselves on the other side but of course that sets up the mm. whole cycle to binge again and actually the best thing you can do if you binge is actually go back and eat your meals the next day don't go into the starving because you're more likely to binge again later and that's it's just coming back to having a plan a little bit in place to kind of go well this is roughly what I'm doing for breakfast or lunch or dinner and you come back to that so whatever else happens if you have a good day if you have a bad day if you have a total nightmare of a day mm. this plan is here and say well look I'm just going to make sure I have my vitamin d in today and make sure I have my iron you know I've got my fish mm. in a couple of times a week and you know accept the fact that we are human we all have good days and bad days and things like yes. that and that's okay yes. and just come back. so don't kind of give up yeah. the whole thing just because it went wrong on this meal or this day or this week yes. you know I really like your message there of that of you know being human and accepting ourselves for the fragility we carry and also trying to be kind and that compassionate message which is one we mm. we very much espouse here at, at aware too so it's, it's lovely to hear that and, and listen to you speak to that um, and and obviously just to, to to move it on a little bit that you've mentioned uh, the aspect of eating disorders and I've read something you know since the the pandemic there's been uh, a huge increase in in the amount of people reporting and seeking treatment for an eating disorder and obviously that's not our bailiwick and that's not our area of expertise mm -hmm. so I would encourage anyone in in the uh, participant audience here who's um, experiencing that difficulty to reach out for help initially at their GP and to to seek support and help for that we signpost people to body wise just as a, yeah. as a matter of interest and to, and to mention them but just maybe to get a line or two from your own perspective on that Sarah. Now, again it's a few years since I've worked specifically in eating disorders myself but definitely talking to colleagues there's been a huge upswing with that and I think you know it reflects I think a lot of our stress and I also think it reflects a lot of our support networks you know haven't been there to the same extent that they would have mm. been you know with COVID we've been so restricted in so many areas and mm. I think it you know people will deal with their stress in so many different ways and people who need a lot of support maybe not have have been getting it and I agree with you body wise are fantastic and um, there's some excellent core registered dietitians who work with eating disorders as well mm. um, and I'll put some links actually for for people to contact there but I'd say reach out for help with it is the key thing um and you know to i suppose comes back to the body kindness all the time and i think it's a mm. little bit back to what i was saying even in january we have this huge pressure on weight and detox and all of this in january which i think drives us to the idea that our bodies just aren't good enough as they are yes. and you know our bodies detox beautifully our bodies you know are very good at looking after themselves and i think you know we, we have this pressure to have this perfect body this perfect ideal and i think we need to let that go as well um, mm. you know, because I think we put ourselves under huge pressure sometimes with that, or even if we're not terribly under pressure, we still have this, oh, I shouldn't really eat that, or I should feel guilty about this. And, you know, I think when we catch ourselves having negative thoughts about food like that, it's just to sit down and go, it's just food. Mm. You know, it mm. is just food. Um, yeah. It's, it's yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Because I was thinking a little bit, you know, I was thinking about some descriptions I have heard in, 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 in working with the way around the description of depression. And a lot of people might say, I feel empty which mm -hmm. actually metaphorically speaks to something around food, perhaps yes. if you think about it that way, you know, that feeling of emptiness, which is linked to uh, uh, depression, you know, around the description of it. And um, so, so the, there's this link uh, in a way, you know, de depression, food, mental health, and what we do, you know, around nurturing that and uh, what a significant contributing factor to that is a nutritious diet without it being kind of exalted into, it has to be uh, too rigid. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, and you know, as I said, when I do work with people who are struggling with mental health and they're looking at how do I change my diet, they're nearly disappointed sometimes that I haven't given them this big book of rules and this rigid, yes. you know, and while the rules might be reassuring at the start, I hate doing it because I think people then feel if they break outside of that, they've done something wrong. Um, which they haven't and I think I mean you, you touch on two things with the depression you said feeling empty for some people they will fill that with food but not mm. always with food that's nourishing them um, mm. but on the other hand we know lots of people with depression their appetite goes they eat less yes. and then you're missing the nutrition there as well so it can kind of come at it from both angles um, with it and that's yeah. why, again a small change you don't necessarily have to stop eating all the what we might call sometimes foods but maybe just bring in some of the others 
you know, and I, I often look at that, and I know I mentioned magnesium and sleep earlier, but, you know, if you're not sleeping well, it disturbs your appetite, you will eat more the next day, you'll actually mm. eat up to 380 calories more the next day if you actually have had poor sleep. I see. So if we can actually forget about trying to eat less, let's have a look at can we do something with sleep? Can we get the magnesium in there? And, you know, there's loads of other things, I mean, not just from nutrition that helps sleep. So I think sometimes we focus on the food all the time, whereas sometimes the actual reason you're eating is somewhere else. Um, and mm. so rather than feeling bad about the food, let's see what's actually going on that we can fix on that side. Right. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, could you say a little bit more about the sometimes foods? I, I'm guessing that is so around the pyramid. I remember you used to see the pyramid at the dentist. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> is the sometimes food something around sugars? Is, is that yeah. What so, I mean, what, what we would always talk about, you know, if, you've, if you're familiar with the food pyramid, we're talking about we want lots of the nice fruit and vegetables in there. We want the whole grains. We want your, your calcium, so your dairy foods and your proteins. What we talk about with sometimes foods is foods that would wouldn't be terribly nutritious in the sense that they're not giving us much in the way of vitamins or minerals or things like that um, and they might be a lot higher in things like salt or sugar or saturated fat things that we want to the body doesn't need a whole lot of so I would always talk about them as sometimes foods because I think you know people often talk about bad foods like they're not bad foods I mean yeah. anyone who knows me I love chocolate um, mm. and I eat chocolate and I'm never going to stop eating chocolate and that's okay um, mm. but it's a sometimes thing and um, you know, and I think if we talk about foods as not good or bad, and we take that whole judgment out of it a little bit, yes, and um, it's perfectly okay to go and have the packet of crisps and the takeaway or whatever, you know, with that in, in the context of getting other foods with it. So I think if you think about them as sometimes rather than bad, and mm, um, it, it positions them, I think, mentally a little bit better that there's nothing yes. wrong with eating these foods, mm. but we want to lean into some of the other foods a little bit more. That's it, exactly, Sarah. And just one final point, maybe, before we, we head towards the finish of the, of the webinar this afternoon is around um, the use of, of whey uh, proteins or mm -hmm. the, the, the bulk proteins. I don't know if I'm describing them right. Yes. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't know too many adolescents, uh, but I know I've heard them in, in, the, in the eater being uh, taken on and uh, what's your sense of that is you know uh, helpful unhelpful or, or whatever I mean, they're, they're products that are incredibly popular but they're really designed for um someone who is trying to gain a lot of muscle but usually for like professionally for sports I see. um you know and that's where those products originated now they've become very popular and i suppose what i see an awful lot is particularly boys 15 16 17 who want to yes. bulk up um, and they want to use these powders, and they want to go to the gym. And it's, you know, sometimes you're trying to explain to them that just from a physiological point of view, boys are going to grow tall till they're actually about 22. Mm. Then they're going to fill out and you're trying to rush something that isn't your body isn't naturally going to do. Yes. Now you will get some boys who will naturally be bulkier at 15, 16, but they're unusual. Um, you know, but I think with sports and particularly, and, and I see a lot of boys who are kind of the Gaelic and the rugby and they really want to bulk up and there's often yes. pressure maybe from sports teams to do it. They can, I mean, the whey powders can be helpful, but we don't recommend them for anyone under 16. Yes. Um, if someone is using them over that, be very careful. Um, like they're not dangerous. Okay, you're not going to drop dead from using them or anything like that. So I wouldn't be like if a parent, if if a parent is here and they have a child is using them, I wouldn't be rushing out to ban them or anything. Mm. Um, but what I would say is that it'd be careful not to focus just on the way to the exclusion of other foods. And I sometimes see, particularly um, you know, the teenage boys, and I, I nearly feel sorry for them. They have this, we often used to, you know, when I was start as a dietitian women had this huge pressure to be skinny 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 whereas boys didn't yes. seem to have the same pressure but how boys have to have these muscles and these ab abs mm. and you know and just thinking oh can we not move away from having all these pressures on body sizes whether you're a man or a woman but they're, they're there um and really what you're looking at is is kids having this huge pressure on it um and really focusing on protein and they're not then getting what i, I you know i'm always thinking of uh, boys that i'd see and they're they've all this protein and it's fantastic but they've no fiber and they're coming mm. into me because they're having digestive problems and the reason mm. they have digestive problems is because they're not eating any fiber but they think they have this healthy diet because they have all of this protein in these whey powders so the powders can be useful they can have a place for sure but it's once you you have to get the basics right you have to get the healthy diet right and then you might look at protein powders if that's necessary mm. um in a lot of cases it isn't yeah great yeah and we're into that kind of bigger issue around body image and you know, all of that and, and yeah. all of what lies in that and mm. 
you know, the societal aspect of that and, and pressures and all that. So, you know, it's been really fascinating listening to you describe from the outset, Sarah, you know, your, your deep knowledge and understanding of the, of the whole realm of food and the uh, impact of, of what we take into our bodies and what we, you know, eat and our relationship with food and the different kind of key nutrients. And I think there's some great takeaways for people in, in the audience and in, including myself um, to, to take on board, you know, and especially, you know, around this idea of, you know, the compassionate aspect of it and uh, trying not to be too rigid or getting into a kind of uh, unhealthy or unhelpful kind of dogmatic thoughts about yeah. because things are changeable and it's trying this idea of uh, trying to be as kind to ourselves as possible, which is a great way to start the new year. So I'd really like to thank you for your, your time and your, your, your expertise in, in, in the subject area uh, and for, for taking the time to join us on, on this uh, webinar for, for uh, January 22 with the WEAR. Um, we have to um, say that for our next webinar, we haven't uh, finalized details of that, but we'll be in touch uh, with, with you if you wish to subscribe to our uh, webinar newsletter please uh, uh, sign up to that on uh, our website uh, and for further information as i say you know at where.ie forge slash forge slash forward slash apologies webinars you know you'll get further information on on that there and you'll get a follow-up email post this webinar and also just to encourage you if uh, you have been impacted by any of the subject matter or discussion uh, between sarah and i uh, this afternoon please reach out for support uh, with, with your GP or if you have any follow-up questions please reach out for support and you'll get a plethora of information on support for depression and bipolar disorder and the services we offer on our website aware.ie and also in relation to nutrition and diet uh, uh, dietitian related information on, on Sarah's website eatwell.ie is that right eatwell.ie yeah and I have information on my Instagram page at Sarah Kyo Ordi. great stuff thanks very much Sarah not at um, all thanks for inviting you're very welcome all the best for now. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.